this month of women's ministry. May you experience God's blessing during this worship time of rejoicing. If you're here for the first time or if you have a prayer request or a word of thanksgiving, please let us know or place a note in the offering. Let us turn to God with glad hearts, joining together in the call to worship. Depend on the Lord for strength. Always go to God for help. Remember the amazing things God has done. Remember God's miracles and fair decisions. When God caused a famine in the country and people did not have enough food, God sent a man named Joseph to go ahead of them. Joseph was sold as a slave. They tied a rope around his feet and put an iron ring around his neck. Joseph was a slave until the things he predicted have really happened. The Lord's message proved that Joseph was right. So the king of Egypt sent him free. The king put Joseph in charge of his house. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn is I Know Whom I Have Believed and it is found in your bulletin. Please stand together.
Let us continue in an attitude of prayer together. In this month of women's ministry, O oh God who created us, and in this time when in this country we celebrate our queen and we celebrate Mother's Day, we thank you for all those who have gone before us in the faith. We thank you for our ancestors in the church all through history and our ancestors in scripture. And they are our ancestors because in Jesus Christ, you have adopted us into the family of your servants. Give us the courage to give our hearts, our lives, and our strength to your service. In his name we pray, amen. seated as we continue to pray together. O oh God who created us, we are here to give you thanks for all your gifts, yet we also bring our doubts and our fears, our stubbornness and our forgetting of what others have done for us and of all that you have done for us. Forgive us, we pray, and open our eyes so that we may not forget any gift or any kindness, and that we might be more ready to do the things that are kind. Let us be ready, too, to receive your truth from others in the faith, no matter what their position or ranking might be. We pray for your church all over the world. We give you thanks for those who are faithful. We also pray for those who fail. We pray for the earth, asking that all of us would turn and work to save its beauty and its richness. We pray for the many places and people all over the world who are suffering. We remember the victims of flooding in this country some of them are our own Christian brothers and sisters. Some of them are our pastors. We pray for those who have been affected by the volcano in, in Indonesia, the earthquake in China, unrest and wars in any place in the world. We pray for the nations of the world, asking for peace and remembering that you call us to make true peace with justice in our own families and with our own neighbors. O oh God of faith, we pray for our families, our friends, and our communities. Bless all of these in the name of Christ, our Savior. As our Lord taught us, so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to this time of worship, to this English language worship service at Watana Church. We have changed the order of worship a little, and the announcements will be at the end of the service. But I want to remind everyone that it has been a tradition in the churches for centuries 
to offer forgiveness to others in the service, and that is what began our greeting to one another. And so now, let us please stand and greet first the stranger and then the friend, saying the peace of Christ be with you. Let us ask our God to make us ready to hear the, the truth. O oh God, who created us through the creatures, you have sent many messages of your love and your salvation to the people of this world. Give us understanding hearts, we pray, and let us be made new through the fruitful words of scripture and the teaching of your servant this morning, we pray to Jesus Christ, amen. Greetings. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Watana Church. And um, my name is Pastor Life, and I'm a pastor of Mueng Thai Church, uh, a, a Thai church downtown. Um, I'm also honored every time I'm here. This is the only time I get to uh, brush up on my English and, um, and preach the Word of God in English. And so um, I'm very thankful. And I pray that this morning, the Word of God would come upon you and challenge you in such a way that even though the text this morning is a simple text that you remember since your childhood, but this morning I, I ask that um, the Holy Spirit would, would convict you and, and challenge you um, to live out the Word of God this morning. So before we start, could I just give uh, a short word of prayer and ask God to be here with us. Heavenly Father, I come before you humble, knowing how much you love all of us. And Lord, I, I pray that this morning you would come down in your power, you would come down personally, intimately, and challenge all of us through your word of God. So Lord, I pray that you would be here and we invite you to speak and do whatever work you need to do in our lives. Help us to be obedient to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, I want to speak to you about um, the love of God. And even though the love of God has been preached over and over. It could never be um, extensively explained. But the, word, the love of God, to me, it, it drives me and pushes me to, to live a, a different sort of life. If, if you know, knew me before and if you knew me now, uh, you, you would not believe that, that this is the same person um, before I met God my life was in such a wreck and, and God did some tremendous transforming work within my life and this morning um, I, I found myself sometimes get into this rut of, of Christianity that I believe and I'm sure a lot of you are sitting here sometime believe this uh, to be true that if you live your life if you live your life good enough then it would be pleasing to God if you do something good enough to other people, uh, that is the will of God. And, you know, and I think a lot of times I misunderstood uh, this to be true because every time I, I felt like if I, if I do a little bit more than just a normal standard goodness, 
then I would be doing something pleasing to God. Which is true in a way, but sometimes I, I get into this mode where when I walk past the overpass, you know, and, and I see the beggar sitting there, I, I felt like if I would have just given 20 baht, it would be the standard price. But if I would have given, you know, a 50 baht, I would be a Christian. I would do something that Jesus Christ would, would, would wanted me to do to, to, to be more. When I go and eat at a restaurant, I felt like I had to tip more. Um, and, you know, when I go to a restaurant, sometimes uh, when I sit down and, and pray uh, with my family to eat, I, I felt like I have to pray a little bit louder so that I could be a witness to the next, you know, the next seat beside me. I'm like, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. And I, I felt like if I did that, I would be a great witness, you know, to the next um, seat. And I felt like if, if, if you and me, a lot of times, I felt like if, if we did things good enough, it would be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And I, I used to believe that, that if I live my life in that way, to do good, to be good, then it would be, it would be God's will. And I, I think a lot of Christians um, believe that to be true within their lives. I think a lot of you sitting here going, wait a minute, Pastor Life, isn't that true, what you've just said? I mean, God is pleased when He sees our lives, you know, living in such a good manner and, and well-behaved um, and, and, and doing good to our neighbors. Isn't that what God really wants? Now, before you stone me, uh, if I've said this word, don't, please don't grab the stone and start throwing at the, you know. God is pleased when, when you are a good person, but that's not all His will. God wants you to be so much more than a good person. God wants you to be so much more than to live a good life. You know, I, I've seen a lot of Christians and a lot of organizations set out to do good to other people. And I, I have nothing against that. I have nothing against, you know, getting blankets up to the north where people are cold. I have nothing. I actually took so many students up on, you know, um, trips to do that. I've, 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 I've done, I've worked with so many organizations that, that do good for society. And I, I believe that is a good thing. But I don't want us to mistake, mistaken that this is actually all that we are called to do. And a lot of Christians sitting here, um, including me, I would be the first one who raised my hands and say, I thought that if I did just this, then it would be good enough to get to heaven, or it would be good enough to be pleasing in God's sight. And a lot of us, we believe that, you know, if we take this elderly person across the street, we pick up the trash, we do this and do that as a good person. But that's exactly not what God had in mind when He created us. God doesn't want us just to live a good life for other people. God doesn't, doesn't want just that. Because, you know, if you go and look in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is saying, you know, if you greet your only, just the, the brothers or the people who love you, if you just do good to those, I mean, how different are you with a tax collector? Aren't they doing that? I mean, if you're just doing good, how are you different than, you know, the Gentiles? So this morning, I want to, I want to bring you to passages of Scripture that actually proclaims the calling of God in our lives, that He does not just call us to live a good life, but He calls us to lay down our lives for others. Now these are two different concepts that you and I, um, we sometimes blended together and we said, okay, this is the same thing. But actually to live our lives for other people, and to lay down our lives for other people are two different worlds apart. There are so many teachers within, within our, our human history that, you know, taught good philosophical um, lessons and have good quotes 
and people use them all the time, and, and you know, Confucius, um, Lord Buddha, all of them have good teaching. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, his teachings is a little bit different. If we dive into the, um, the passage of Scripture that we will do in, here in just a minute, if you look at God's message, when, he, when, when Jesus starts preaching, it demands us to follow and to be obedient. It, demand, it pushes us from a listener to a doer. It, it, it challenges the listener to just not listen and take down notes, but to actually put their foot forward. Get out of the boat and start walking. And I, I, I want to, to bring you to the first passage of Scripture this morning about God's love in our life. God is calling us to love other people in such a way that it confuses them, that it leaves questions. So the first passage of Scripture is John 3.16. The passage of Scripture that you and I, we, we know it by heart. All of you, you don't even have to, you know, look at the, the screen. You can just close your eyes and, and actually say it together. Can you actually say it together this morning? One, two, three. shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, all of us that are sitting here, we, we remember that and we, we learn that and we listen in to it so many times until it, it sort of like glides through our consciousness. But if you sit down and you actually look at the words of, of God, for God so loved the world that it moves him to do something about his love pushes him to, to, to come into an action of giving up something that he loves dearly. For God so loved you and me that he actually had to sacrifice, that he actually has to lay down his one and only son. It is the only thing that he, he believes that it would change and transform the world. It is the only thing to cure sin. It is the only thing to allow the, the, the wicked person to go into heaven. It is so that it would be according to the rule. When one person sin, one person dies. For God so loved the sinners, just you and I, that he gave his one and only son. Now I have a son. And my son, if you knew him, he is uh, one of the sweetest kid I've known. I'm not biased, but he is. Um, he would walk up to, to teachers in our school that would, uh, she just lost her, her sister. And he would be the only student walking up to my, uh, the teacher and gave her a hug and said, you know, I want to give you a hug. He's grade three, and, and I knew you lost your, your sister, and you're sad, and I just want to hug you. I mean, the sweetest kid. Now, for me to imagine that I love someone so much that I put my son and give him up, let him die for someone or something that I love, now that is the kind of love that God is, is showing and modeling for us. If you love someone, you sacrifice the things you love most. And he shows that in Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, sacrificing himself. So this morning, as we come to the first passage of Scripture, we know that God is not just talking lessons. Not, God is not just on the board writing down the, 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 the teachings and just ask us to remember. God is wanting us to see what it's like to give up something that is dear so that you would get someone that you love. Now this morning, the second passage of Scripture is found um, in, in Mark chapter 12 that when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest law of, of Moses? And Jesus said, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he moves on to the second. But the second rule, the second uh, greatest commandment is this. Love your neighbor as... I didn't hear that. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. Now, Jesus is basically saying, 
all the 600 something commandments in the Old Testament now has been boiled up and mixed and, and compact into these two scriptures that says love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself but if you if you didn't know what he meant by neighbor someone asked Jesus you know what what do you mean by neighbor and Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritans right and all of you sitting here you know you've heard before right please not if you have yes okay the Good Samaritan and you realize that the Levites and the priests they all pass this Jewish person that's you know been beat up and been robbed but the person that actually cares for and cares for in such a way that it shows tender mercy love and kindness the kind of the kind of passion that he sits down he bends out get off his horse or mule or the animal and and he puts on the wine and puts on the oil and and put him on the animal and took him to an inn and pays money And Jesus turns around and says, now let me ask you, who is your neighbor? Now for us sitting here going, well, our neighbor is the, you know, the someone who's in trouble. Just anyone out here who's in trouble. If you're in trouble, you're my neighbor. But the actual fact in the scripture tells you that the neighbor is the Samaritan and the Jews who are sole enemies. Who are, you know, Jews would go around, walk for miles and miles just to get around Samaritans so that they wouldn't touch foot on Samaritans. So Jesus is saying, your neighbor is actually your enemy. And Jesus is saying, love your neighbor. Who is your enemy? Now, how many of you sitting here have a neighboring enemy? Please nod. No, I'm just kidding. Don't nod. But I believe all of you are sitting here. You have someone who annoys you. You have someone who just um, you don't don't really get along, and you you're trying to avoid. You try you try not to have an argument, or someone in your life that just keeps picking on you, or just some. And Jesus is saying, you know what? If you're gonna love just as the heavenly Father loves you, you're gonna have to love not just the loving neighbors, but also your enemy. And so this morning, we see two passages of Scripture that, that shines light on how we should live our life of love. Now, when we come to the third passage and the final passage this morning, this is a passage where we, a lot of times, forget. We, we, we've been memorizing John 3.16 uh, all our lives, and we forget to memorize 1 John 3.16. So if you don't know 1 John 3.16, um, I think it, should, it would be on the, the screen. But if it's not, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And here's the catch. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, a lot of you sitting here going, well, I can love my neighbor. I can do good to my enemy. I mean, I've tried. I prayed for those who persecute me. I, I can do good for society. I can, I can, you know, do so many good things for, with so many good organizations. But Jesus is like, hey, wait a minute. No, that's not what I'm asking you to do. I want you to love other people, especially your enemy, the same way I love you. Because yet when we are still sinners, yet when we were still God's enemy, Christ died for us. And so, if someone is a sinner, someone is an enemy, shouldn't we love them? Yes, you should. But it's not just that. Christ didn't just love them. I mean, this world would be a different world if 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked this world and he healed people and he encouraged them and he pat them on the back and he did good and he, you know, set up the, the school of teaching of Jesus. But he didn't. He lived his life 
And he did ministry of, of doing good to other people for three years. But in that final year of his life, he laid it down. He died. He gave up something that he loves most, that he didn't want to give up. I mean, he cried in Gethsemane. He asked God that this cup would be moved from me. I mean, he loved his life. He didn't want to go through that pain and suffering. He didn't want the, the sin of the world to be, uh, to be upon him. But he did because he loves you and I. And this morning he calls you and I to, be, to have that mindset of Jesus Christ in you. Is that to love other people to a point where you lay down your life for them. I'm, I'm a marriage counselor and I, when I sit couples down and I ask them, you know, what, in your definition, what is love? I want to hear. And, you know, one people would say something, one people would say something. And most of the couples would say, love is that, you know, that kind of feeling. Love is that understanding of each other. Love is that... And they try to describe love in such a way that they, they possibly could understand. But, you know, when it boils down to the very core of love, to the very content of love, what is love? Love is to suffer for other people. Love is to suffer for their good. I mean, if you marry, you know this to be true. You suffer for the one you love. I mean, my wife asked me to do things I don't want to do. Yes, all the husband, please nod. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not in the, I'm not ready to do that. But because I love her. So this morning, as, as we, we come to the Word of God, Jesus is calling. He looks to his disciples and says, you know what? I love you guys, and I give my life for you guys, and I want you to go out and do exactly the same thing. You know why this passage of Scripture has not been heard a lot or preached a lot? Why John 3.16 seems you know, so attractive? Because we get everlasting life. It sounds good. But when it comes to this passage of Scripture, it requires us to move from a listener to a doer. And not just a doer, a person that would give up something. Now this morning, what makes you have life? What is something that you would consider as factors, important factors in your life? Is it time? Is it energy? Is it money? Your job, probably? And this morning, Jesus looks, and I, I, I hope that this passage of Scripture is speaking to you, saying that, you know what? You've got to lay down those things for other people. God is calling you. And this is a calling for every individual who believes in Him. The only way this world will know Christ is not by someone who do, to do good. I mean, there's such a difference between living your life for someone so that they would see the goodness of Christ and to lay down your life for someone so that they would experience the love of Christ. In my life, I've, I've, I've met many missionaries and there are all sorts of missionaries but I appreciate the missionaries in, in my church. They come from an organization called TMS Global. And what they do is they, they spend six months studying our language, Thai language, before they move to Thailand. And, and when they move to Thailand, they, they lay down everything that they are and they, they, they give up, they lay down their bags they took up the, the form of, of Thai person. They go and live in the small community. They eat what they, the Thai people eat. They, they eat more Thai than me. And I'm Thai. 
and I'm ashamed of myself. But I'm proud that, I, I mean, I've seen people who gave up their, not just, not just parts of their lives, but their whole entire family. Their kids are playing on the ground in right at, you know, playing with chickens, just like the normal Thai kids. And I see that and I, I go, wow, this, this is not just living your life to teach English in a school uh, for someone, but this is giving up your life for, I mean, not just, not just Thai language, but, but time, but energy, but every part of their being. When God called me out of uh, international school setting, and in my, my, my leave, my letter, and I asked God, Lord, what do you want me? How do you, how do you want me to, to live my life for the, the rest of my life? Who do you want me to, to lay down my life for? Because, I mean, I've, I've given my time to the international schools. I played basketball with them. I sat down and I cried with them. I, I visited them in hospital. I visited their homes. I take them on, on trips. I, I preach at them and I counsel them. But now, when you call me to a full-time, where do you want, who do you want me to lay down my life for? And God reveals that it's for the poor and the needy. I open up an English school. I teach uh, slum kids um, in, near, near my church. And I teach taxi drivers English. And we have a, a whole course. And this kind of love, when, when I go, walk into the classroom and the taxi driver just looks at me and say, Teacher, I, I, know you, I know you want to teach us English, but I don't understand why. It just confuses them. It, it brings them to a, a point where they ask you why. When my father and mother is a, you know, both of them have doctorate degrees from the States and both of them drive seven hours a week. They've been driving for 15 years, one million kilometers. They broke down three cars. They, I mean, destroyed it. And, and you know, just to teach English to the poor uh, students in Ryan. And the students look at them and they go, why? Why are you doing this? I mean, you're 72. Why are you coming to teach us? Why are you driving from Bangkok to, to Ran Nong for nine hours and teach us for two days and then go back? Why? Because God has called us not just to live a, a good life for other people. Because God has called us to lay down our entire existence for their benefit. I have two students that come to study with me at, at, at night. I don't teach privately, but two students I, that God reveals to me and say, life, take them on and, 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 and take them and, and preach them and teach them and, and, and be friends with them. They come to study with me from 9 p.m. to midnight. I mean, who teaches at 9 p.m. to midnight? I don't know. But I know one thing that I do have to lay down my life for other people. I, w I was given an opportunity to go and teach at this course at a university. And this course is called DEF and a lot of uh, teachers, uh, people that come to this course, they paid 200,000 to come and study this course for 10, 10 weeks and I was one of the main speaker and I go up and I, I teach on uh, uh, online social uh, business and, and I told them what kind of work that I do, uh, the ministries that I have, uh, and they, they looked at me. They don't understand. These are businessmen who, you know, have millions and millions of, and they control their company, CEO and everything. And they look at me and they go, why? Why are you doing this? I don't understand. You, you, you had money. You, you had status. Why are you doing this? And this morning, after, I mean, after I taught that course, when I came down, all these businessmen came to me and said, Pastor, I want to do what you do. I go, great. They said, but I can't. How much is your project? Here's my business card. I'll, whatever amount you need, just tell me. 
I go, well, that's great, but no, that's not what I want. I want you to get in a van with me and go to Riot. And I want you to, to spend your time. I want you to give your life, part of your life at least. And they said, I can't. See, God is calling us to do something that is impossible. Yeah, I said it. This morning, all the things that I preach, all of those are impossible. You can't do it. You can only do good. But you can't lay down your life for other people. Not by yourself. The only way you can do that is to come to an understanding of God's love for you. The kind of love that that he would sacrifice his own life for you. And when you come to that knowledge, when you come to that understanding, when it seeps into your heart, then your, your, your whole being, your whole entire existence starts moving and it's naturally laying down of life for the benefit of other people. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation Listen to me, participation in his suffering. I want to suffer like Jesus Christ did so that other people would understand how much I love you. I mean, Jesus Christ suffered a lot. You've seen the passion of the Christ. And Apostle Paul said, I want to participate in that. Nobody in their right mind says that. Only the people that has been called to do so. And here's the catch. I want to participate in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. I know it's, it's a passage of scripture that's hard to, to swallow in and, and actually obey it. But this morning, before I close, it's not something big that you have to do. The laying down of life is not, you know, you don't walk out in front of Sukhumvit and push someone out of the road and say, I'll die for you. No, it's not, not, nothing like that. It's just small little things that you give up. My haircut. I, I value my hair. Thai people value, especially men. Thai men value their hair a lot because we have a lot of them. When I was in uh, international school, I get haircut about 300 baht. I think it's an okay price for a Christian to get a haircut at 300 baht. But um, after, after I became a pastor, I don't want to spend that much or I don't have that much to spend. So I, I go to get a haircut for 100 baht at a BTS or a MRT. They have an easy, quick cut. But one day the shop was closed. so. I decide to walk into my soy, and there's, you know, the traditional Thai barber. You know, the adults, 90 baht, and for the children, 70 baht. But I've heard stories about, you know, they're not clean and using the same blade and, you know, disease and whatnot. But you know what? I don't have money, so I'll just walk in. And I, I sat down, and since that day, I determined that I'm going to come and get a haircut here with that exact barber. And I'm going to sit with him. He has one hour with me. I mean, I have his one hour. And I declared that no matter how bad my haircut comes out, and it came out quite not okay. <laughs> I mean, I looked into the mirror and I said, well, that's okay, because I get to spend one hour with this guy. And now, his kids come and study English for free. And now I'm, you know, investing in his life. Anything you want me to... I, I, that's laying down a, a, a part of your life. That's laying down my hair, though. But that's just the small little things God has called. I mean, if we obey God's message this morning, you know, what kind of church what kind of life we would be living. So I just, I just want to leave the Word of God with you and, and hope the Spirit moves you to, to do His work within you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you and I ask 
that you would change our attitude about living our lives to love other people. I mean, it's easy to love them by being kind and doing good. But Lord, I pray that that's not all that we do. I pray that you challenge us to lay down our lives for other people so that they would come to a loving, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Some of us may come to God thinking we have little to give. God asks for our money, our time, our abilities, even if they seem small to us. But most of all, as Pastor Life shared with us this morning, God asks us to give our whole lives. The gifts we share in this offering are signs of our commitment. Let us bring our tithes and our offerings.
This is the time we dedicate our gifts of money to God. Let us not fool ourselves, though. We cannot give money and hold back our time, our care for others, or even any trouble in our lives. We are challenged to give all of that, too. We are challenged to lay down our lives. O oh God who made us, don't let us look for mistakes in others, forgetting that we also need your healing. But do not let us curse our own mistakes and sins, forgetting that there is forgiveness in you. Fill us with joy and thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our hymn of thanksgiving is We've a Story to Tell to the Nations, as found in your bulletin. seated for the announcements for a moment. We want to remind everyone that we are actually taking time for meditation and prayer and worship for the whole hour before this service begins and you are welcome to that time. We take 15 minutes of silence beginning at 8 o'clock, 15 minutes of scripture being read aloud continuously. 15 minutes of prayer, and 15 minutes of singing the hymns that we will join together in singing during the service. 
You are all welcome to this time. It is a very special time of peace and meditation together. Also, you are invited to share in the fellowship time after this service. It's held in the Mana Dining Hall, and uh, it is very special for those who come to this service to get to know one another. We have two Bible classes on Sunday mornings, one that is taught by Ajahn Morchi and is a continuing study of the scripture, and one that I teach, uh, which is the introduction to the Christian faith, and all are welcome. You are also welcome to stay for lunch with everyone. I want to remind those who are on the rotation of the worship team, the elders, the worship leaders, the vocal leaders, the musicians, all who participate. We have a training session this Saturday, August 20th at 1 o'clock. We will be in the choir room just above Mana Dining Hall at this end of the building. And we really encourage you to come. It helps very much to learn to speak more clearly because there are people from many countries here worshiping together. So if you have not seen your email and did not know this, uh, please be there and please talk it up with other members of the team. And now I ask that we would stand for the closing prayer and the benediction. Lord Jesus Christ, you did say, love others not only as you love yourself, but love others as I have loved you. And we know that you did that in so many ways, including washing the feet of your students. And even they thought that you shouldn't be doing that. Oh Lord, lead us to be your true servants in this life. And now may the grace of God who has made us, the love of Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen.